with me, Mark White, here on GB News. For more than two decades, I've been at the sharp end of reporting crime and security at home and abroad. From the scourge of terrorism to the fight against violent crime and the deepening small boats crisis in the channel. There are issues you rightly care about, and so do I. As GB News Home and Security Editor, my focus will be on the stories that matter to you. And welcome to a whole new week of On The Money, your daily weekday dose of economics, business and consumer news. I'm Liam Halligan, and for the next hour, we'll be debating the NHS backlog, the expansion of the ultra-low emission zone in London, and we'll be talking to one of the UK's leading automotive retailers as part of my in-depth Money Talk series. So stay with us. But first, it's the GB News headlines with Amelia Harper. I'm Amelia Harper. This is your news at one o'clock. The average UK petrol price has reached an all-time high at 142.94 pence a litre. On Sunday, prices beat records set back in April 2012 by 0.46 pence. Meanwhile, diesel prices reached 146.5 pence a litre. The RAC is calling it a dark day for drivers that will hurt many household budgets. 52 people have been arrested after Insulate Britain brought London's financial district to a standstill today. Protesters took to the streets of the city of London and Canary Wharf. Injunctions have already been imposed on some protesters after they caused delays on the M25 and other major roads during five weeks of action. A spokesperson says they will continue until the government gives a meaningful statement that they can trust. Meanwhile, £5.9 billion will be made available in the upcoming budget to help tackle NHS backlogs. On Wednesday, the Chancellor is set to announce that £2.3 billion of that will be used to fund community diagnostic centres. Despite the cash injection this lunchtime, Health Secretary Sajid Javid says it's impossible to know if the backlogs will be cleared within three years. It's come as the Health Secretary Sajid Javid says the government is heading towards legislating mandatory COVID vaccines for all NHS staff. A member of the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation is also urging NHS workers to get double jabbed as a matter of professional pride. Elsewhere, Scotland's First Minister says the COP26 Global Climate Conference in Glasgow could be the last opportunity to avert a climate catastrophe. Nicola Sturgeon says Scotland is in a unique position to act as a bridge between gaps in conversation between world leaders. She says global pledges must be backed by credible actions. She says so-called face-saving slogans are not enough. We work to ensure that leaders of my generation understand that failure to act now would be a betrayal of young people right around the world. There is a lot at stake in our city over the next three weeks. There is no doubt about that. This may well be the world's best, but also possibly its last opportunity to avert climate catastrophe. The husband of detained British Iranian aid worker Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe has gone on hunger strike for the second time in two years. Richard Ratcliffe is sleeping in a tent outside the Foreign Office in London after his wife lost her appeal for freedom. Mr Gary Ratcliffe has been held in jail in Iran since 2016, accused of plotting to topple the government. Their daughter, Gabriella, who's now seven, played a mock-up game of snakes and ladders outside Parliament to illustrate the challenges they face in getting her mother home. Richard Ratcliffe says he wants to go back to being a normal family. Probably part of, of, of what we wanted to do today was just to say, listen, this is, we've all had a lot of ups and downs in our lives, you know, this is a heck of a long time for this to be dragging on. Um, and, and of course, you know, over time I've been on the television lots and lots and been on you know, the newspapers lots and lots and we'd love to go back to being a normal family and, and I still have every faith that one day we will. 
And Friends actor James Michael Tyler has died aged 59 after being diagnosed with prostate cancer. The actor, who was best known for playing coffee shop manager Gunther, revealed in June that the disease had spread to his bones. He died at his home in Los Angeles. In this archive interview, he said he never knew just how big the show was going to be. I kept my job at the actual coffee shop that I was working at as a real barista in real life the first four years that Friends ran. I would shoot maybe two or three days a week on Friends, and then I kept my shifts at the real coffee shop. So I'd go in there, and people would walk in and do a double or triple or quadruple take, and often say, Gunther, what are, wait, you're, what, what, what are you doing here? And I'm like, what would you like? You know, please, let's, can we hurry this thing up? You know, a latte, cappuccino, but it would blow people's minds. You're right up to date. I'll bring you the latest headlines in half an hour. Now let's return to On The Money. And this is On The Money coming up today as Rishi Sunak prepares to splash yet more of our cash on the National Health Service. Is it really all about the money? We discuss whether the NHS can be made more efficient and is our health service truly world-class, as, as we're so often told? And each day, of course, On The Money features an in-depth Money Talks interview with a business leader, policymaker, or someone else with an interesting perspective. Well, today we're talking to Robert Forrester, the CEO of Virtue Motors, the UK's fifth largest motor retailer selling new and used cars and the largest in the Northeast. He's got an annual turnover of almost £4 billion. That's later in the show. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, suggestions. What should On The Money be covering? And what do you think of today's debate? Get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. We'll be reading out some of your emails later in the show, so stay with us. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and you're On The Money. In his budget statement on Wednesday, Rishi Sunak set to unveil yet another £5 billion for the National Health Service. That's 5,000 million, or five followed by nine zeros. That's in addition to a £12 billion NHS maintenance fund uplift, and on top of the three-year £36 billion additional funding for NHS and social care announced just a few weeks ago, which ministers have since admitted will overwhelmingly be allocated to the NHS. The growth in the NHS budget over recent years has been astonishing. The Health Department spent £212.1 billion in 2020-21. That's up from £150.4 billion the previous year, a 40% increase, which in part reflects the COVID pandemic. As recently as 2008, the NHS budget was £118 billion. So we've seen a 78% rise in NHS spending over little more than a decade, a decade of austerity spending, according to many. During lockdown, non-COVID treatments were scaled back. As a result, nearly 6 million people are now waiting for routine operations, the longest NHS waiting list since records began. Life-changing procedures, including hip and knee replacements and cataract operations, are among the treatments most longest delayed. One in ten of us are now on an NHS waiting list. That represents untold human suffering. No wonder the government wants to be seen throwing money at our health service. But is more money the answer? How about spending the existing huge NHS be budget better? The UK prides itself on free at the point of use healthcare. This is a principle many of us are rightly proud of, a principle I would robustly defend. But surely there must be a better way to deliver universal health care for all without relying on a single monolithic, often wasteful organisation employing an astonishing 1.3 million people. We're constantly told the NHS is the best in the world. Really? Check out these conclusions from a pre-pandemic study by the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the King's Fund and the Nuffield Trust three of the most highly respected research bodies in our country. Among its strengths, the NHS does better than health systems in comparable countries at protecting people from heavy financial costs when they're ill. Well, of course it does. It's free at the point of use. 
Its main weakness, the study continued, is healthcare outcomes. The UK appears to perform less well than similar countries on the overall rate at which people die when successful medical care should, could have saved their lives. Although the gap has closed over the last decade for stroke and severe forms of cancer, the report continues, the mortality rate in the UK among people treated for some of the biggest causes of death, including cancer, heart attack and stroke, is higher than average among comparable countries. The UK also has high rates of child mortality around birth. Health Secretary Sajid Javid is setting up an NHS delivery unit to oversee an efficiency drive. Other cabinet ministers privately warn Sajid needs to get a grip of health spending. Not only so additional money translates into more operations, clearing the huge backlog, but there will also be serious political fallout if our health service keeps drawing money away from social care. It's almost impossible to suggest meaningful NHS reforms, even if, like me, you insist on free at the point of use provision. NHS insiders calling out inefficiencies have been drummed out of their jobs or ostracised. And outsiders calling for change are often dismissed as heartless or much worse. Yet we can only improve the NHS, getting more and better health care for the huge sums that we spend on it, if we stop deifying this complex institution, recognising its strengths but also its countless weaknesses and inefficiencies, instead of pretending that they don't exist. These weaknesses should be vigorously addressed. And that's why this question simply must be posed and with attitude. And the question is this. The NHS. Is more money really the answer? As ever on The Money, we have detailed discussions with people who really know their stuff. And one person who knows their stuff is Dr Lawrence Buckman, a GP and former chairman of the British Medical Association's General Practitioners Council. Between 2007 and 2013, Dr Buckman, thank you so much for joining us. Also, Roy Lilly, former NHS Trust chairman. And, of course, I'm joined in the studio by friend of the show and CEO of Blonde Money, Helen Thomas. Welcome to all of you. Dr Buckman, let's start with you. You've been at the NHS at the front line. You've been the chairman of the BMA, which I think we can fairly describe as the Doctors' Trade Union. When it comes to the NHS, can we get more bang for our buck? More money is always welcome, but the honest assessment says that we haven't got the workforce to deliver uh, sufficient of the recovery plan and that means we should be looking at being honest with patients and the public, why we can't deliver. And most of that is because of the absence of bodies. Whether you privatise it or not, there are not enough healthcare workers, doctors, nurses and others, to deliver what is needed. Let's, let's go now to Roy Lilly. You, so you ran an NHS trust... Uh, as the chair, a very complex job. You will have seen all the documentation that you wanted to, I presume. What did you think of my opening words? I'm not a health specialist, but I am an economist who studied the NHS for a lot of my adult life. There are big inefficiencies to my untrained eye. How about to your trained eye? I think it's true. Um, I mean, any, any organisation as big as the NHS, you'll find inefficiencies. Um, and I think, you know, the, the drive to squeeze the uh, more efficiency out of the system is perfectly justified. It's taxpayers' money. But, you know, Lawrence is right. It doesn't matter how you pay for the NHS or how you pay for your health care. If you, you can take your taxes out of your right hand pocket or you can take insurance premiums out of your left hand pocket, it's still your trousers. You still have to pay. At the heart of the difficulties the NHS is facing before COVID, it's worth making this point, it, the workforce has been run down. Between about 2009-10, when the World Banking crisis came in, most public sector organisations uh, had their budgets cut. The NHS didn't, in fairness. It had flatline funding for nearly 10 years. That's what's really created the difficulties. We now have urgent and huge waiting uh, um, a huge uh, staffing workforce problems that you just can't 
overcome. You, know, you can't order a box of doctors from Amazon and get it delivered by tomorrow. It takes ages to train these people. It's getting more difficult to bring them in from overseas because of the government's policy on, on migration. It takes a long time to train them. And now, of course, COVID has exposed those difficulties. We have a huge waiting list now. You know, they say it's 5.7 million. It's probably more than that. And it's going to take a huge push to try and bring that down. So it's, Lawrence is right, fundamentally, we don't have enough people. We, we've certainly got fewer doctors per head of population than any other European or G7, G7 uh, similar country. We just don't have the people. And here's the important thing, uh, Liam, there is no workforce plan. That's not the fault of the NHS. The NHS has been saying, for, for God's sake, get, let's have a workforce plan. The government won't publish a workforce plan because I think they're frightened of the cost of it. Helen, you've worked at the top of government. You're a, a former special advisor to a Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne. You've been in the room when budgets are put together. Um, the NHS, it lurches from political crisis to political crisis, doesn't it? But it seems to me now the biggest waiting list on record, all those non-COVID treatments delayed. This is a big moment. Well, I think the most significant statistic in your intro there, I think you said one in ten on a waiting yeah. list. We're just hearing it might actually be more yeah. than that in reality. About six million. I mean, that basically means we're going to end up that everybody will know somebody Indeed. who's waiting. Now, that is a political time bomb, as much as it's a dreadful health problem. Um, which, of course, therefore means this is a political priority. So no real surprise, Sajid Javid is bouncing into this job as Health Secretary. Number one, spotting that is the key issue politically to ensure that people do feel um, something's being done about it. The question, which is, as you're imposing today, and, and, and as we can see is not clear, is whether the money is going to solve it. But you and me, Helen, you know, we're people who would defend free at the point of use. We're also people interested in, you know, using market mechanisms to get a better outcome. It's very difficult to stand up and say, could we organise the NHS better? Yes, I want to maintain free at the point of use. I'm not a monster. But it's, it's so difficult to have that conversation, isn't it? Well, it has become more and more of a <sighs> light in the touch paper issue, hasn't yeah. it? It really has. And any, I think any, all of us should understand, if you can't have a debate about something, you've got a problem. So we need to somehow, at least, there are complex issues here. There are, we're hearing from our you know, expert health guests. There are answers to this, but if you can't even have the debate, if you can't even question that workforce That's point right. that we're hearing about, right. you're going to get nowhere. So I, I think that really, you know, above all the numbers and whatever the chance is going to throw around, what are, what are we actually going to do? What is the plan to get more staff on the front line, as we're hearing? Let's return to Dr Lawrence Buckman. So, Dr Buckman, I have um, university-age children, so, you know, a lot of my uh, time out of work is talking about exams and kids and what careers they're going to do. And I know many very, very smart young people who may not have absolutely perfect GCSEs and absolutely perfect A-levels, but they are people of huge character and intelligence and they just can't get into medical school. So let me put this to you with huge respect to our GP workforce. Is it a closed shop? Why aren't we training more doctors? Why do we have to import doctors from other countries, often poorer countries, who themselves need those doctors? We have not trained enough of our own doctors for a long time. You're quite right to say that the uh, artificial barrier of getting the finest A-levels or whatever, um, whatever test we use for entry, that artificial barrier is not necessarily the most appropriate one for deciding if someone's a good doctor or not. But those are the barriers universities have used for a long time. If you would make medical schools get bigger, which of course costs money, and need space and all the other things that flow from that, you could then train more doctors. But even if you made a decision tomorrow to spend all of the money that's been put aside for the NHS, and it is a huge sum of money, you're not going to grow those doctors to be useful to getting the waiting list down realistically for eight, nine, ten years, something like that. You've got to take a long-term view. No government has ever taken a long-term view. And I think unless we grasp the workforce issues, including social care workforce, which is shriveling as I speak, um, 
we are never going to be able to process the number of patients who quite rightly do not want to wait on a waiting list for years and years before they have their life-changing surgery or other things done for them. Roy Lilly, former NHS Trust chairman, it strikes me, while I have huge respect for NHS doctors, many of my, it's a cliche, many of my closest friends are NHS doctors. <laughs> I also know, as a very keen observer of the medical scene, that a lot of our doctors, they work two, three days a week for the NHS, despite huge public money being spent training them. Many of them want to work time for much part-time for much of their careers. Now, if people want to work part-time, that's fair enough. But surely the fact that so many people do work part-time when they're doctors needs to be factored in in the number of doctors that we train. And surely we should start now, rather than just saying it will take years. Yeah, one in four doctors uh, work part-time. Um, most of them, if we're talking about primary care, most of them are women, uh, doctors who fit in their responsibilities as a doctor with their responsibilities at home and carers and kids and all the rest of it. So, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a trope to say that. Uh, and if we didn't have full time, uh, full that time means four days. Four, four, sorry to sorry, full time in doctor language is four days a week, right? Uh, after the Blair, after well, the Blair it's, it's a, deal. It's, it's it's a number of sessions per yeah. week. So you which, could do which three amounts sessions. to about four days a week, which is not part time as far as the rest you, of the workforce is concerned. You could do three days a week and, and still do 40 hours. So, I mean, it's complicated, but I accept your point that, that there, 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 there is a, you know, a high percentage of, of part-time uh, people working in the service. But, it, 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 I mean, it doesn't... It, we have to we come back to, to the problem that with the, the sort of heart of the problem. So here we've got uh, Javid today... Uh, stumping up six billion. Now, in fact, we don't know if it's six billion new money. And and Lamb, you will know that until uh, you know Wednesday when Rishi does his thing and we look at the red book, we don't know. We won't know how much new money there is in this. I think it's about twenty percent actually of it is new money, and the rest is coming from existing funding. But we'll find out. So okay, so we have. You have then the government goes out and buys all these shiny new bits of kit, but we won't have anybody to press the buttons because last week the radiographer profession, the consultant radiologist, did their annual survey. They are 30% short of radiographers. So, you know, it's not just doctors and it's not just nurses. The whole workforce has been is run down. So, what do you do? Well, the, then the question then is okay, what? How much healthcare can we deliver with trained people uh, and not professional people? For example, I mean, could we have trained people to take the images and then send the images into another time zone to be read in another country? Could we do that? Yes, we could. So, there's, I mean, there's plenty of things you could do to speed that up. What can we do in a GP surgery that doesn't involve a GP? Well, we're already doing it. There are paramedics in there. There are allied health professionals. There are physiotherapists. I mean, the, the, the whole push in the NHS now is to cascade the work downwards into the most appropriate place that doesn't require they are high skilled professional, but people will still want to see a GP. And, you know, it doesn't matter how you cut this. It comes back to if you look at the data, compare it on a global basis, we do not have enough people. Roy Lilly, very, very interesting. Former NHS Trust chairman and Dr. Lawrence Buckman, of course, GP, former B British Medical Association chair of their practitioners council. You're both people of enormous. Uh, knowledge and integrity. I'm afraid we've run out of time. I'm, I would very much like to continue this discussion on another of occasion, occasion if you are willing. But meanwhile, to both of you gentlemen and, of course, to Helen Thomas, who's going to stay with us, thank you for now. You're watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break, we'll be hearing from our London reporter, Alice Porter, who spoke to London Mayor Sadiq Khan about the expansion of ULES. What's that? That's the ultra low emission zone in London. And your emails are already flooding in thick and fast. We'll be reading out some of those, so stay with us for that. This is GB News, and you're on the money. Hello. 
a bright and breezy day for many of us. There'll be some decent sunny spells, but also quite frequent showers pushing in from the west, even some thunderstorms around because these showers will be very lively, quite an unstable air mass across the UK at the moment, coming from the west behind this weather front, low pressure to the north of the UK. Tightly packed isobars, so a breezy day to come. The breeze pushing the remaining cloud out of the way from East Anglia and the southeast, but uh, soon enough, showers follow in from the west, frequent downpours in the west especially, but just about anywhere could catch these showers. And where they do occur, there'll be some gusty winds and even some thunderstorms with some small hail in places. Nevertheless, a mild day to come, 17 or 16 in the south, 10 or 11 further north, and that's where the strongest breeze will be. The showers quickly die away, actually, after the sun goes down in many places, but they'll continue around western shores, perhaps the odd one coming close to the south coast. Then later in the night, the cloud thickens in the west and it turns wet across western Scotland and Northern Ireland. That'll keep temperatures up at 8 or 9 Celsius, dipping to 5 or 6 in the east of England, where at least we do have some sunshine to begin things on Tuesday, and we keep that sunshine for much of the morning. But the cloud thickens elsewhere, and spells of rain move across Scotland, northern England, into parts of Wales. Some light and patchy drizzle further south, but actually it does dry up a little into the afternoon, although a lot of places stay cloudy. There'll be further outbreaks of rain in the northwest of Scotland, and it's going to be a mild day with this strong southwesterly breeze reaching gale force around northern and northwestern shores. Further spells of rain into the northwest of Scotland on Tuesday night, a lot of cloud elsewhere. And this wet weather sticks around for a time, I think, through Wednesday and into Thursday in the northwest. Increasingly focused, though, on Cumbria around the mid to latter part of this week. And it's going to be mild everywhere. Welcome back. This is On The Money. Now, a lot of you have been getting in touch on that NHS backlog and whether more money is really the answer. I certainly think we could have had a longer discussion there and we will return to this subject on another day. But for now, Gerald says, having worked in the NHS, I know there are far too many managers. Reform certainly needed. Christina says, if we got rid of all the administrators and admin staff, we could open more hospitals and hire more actual frontline staff. Pete says... The NHS should charge visiting foreign nationals for health care at the point of care. It's the National Health Service free at the point of use, not the International Health Service. Well, I know the NHS does sometimes do that, but often those payments slip through the net. 
Andrew says, how can the NHS's problems be due to a lack of staff? It's one of the largest employers in Europe. I think it's the largest employer in Europe. I think only the US Army and the Chinese Army is bigger in the world. Keep your emails coming, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Now, from today, ULES, that's the ultra-low emission zone, is expanding in London, and it will now cover a quarter of the capital. This means that if you have an older petrol or diesel car, you'll have to pay £12.50 a day to drive into the zone. Mayor for London Sadiq Khan says the scheme will clean up London's toxic air pollution. And he hopes that people will sell their older cars for greener vehicles. But critics say most of the money for the scrappage schemes has gone. And over half of motorists in London recently surveyed said they didn't know anything about the expansion of the ultra-low emission zone. Joining me now is our London reporter, Alice Porter. Alice, take it away. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yeah, it's a big day for Londoners because, of course, the ultra-low admission zone is being expanded from today and it means that a quarter of people living in London will be living within this ultra-low admission zone. And that means that if you have a car that is seen to be less compliant with ULES regulations, not so green, uh, sometimes uh, not so old diesel, unfortunately, it will mean you have to pay £12.50 a day to bring it into London. And that is throughout the entire year, apart from Christmas Day. Now, of course, there are some pros and cons to it. I've been speaking to lots of people across London and they all have very different attitudes. On the one hand, it is important to stress that two million Londoners live in the city with illegal levels of pollution. Uh, and it's a really serious issue that affects lots of children's health. Earlier I was speaking to Rosamond Adu Kissy Deborah. Her daughter, Ella, sadly died at the age of nine years old. She was the first person in the UK to have pollution as a cause of death on her death certificate. So that's one sort of side of the equation. On the other side is there's this scrappage scheme, which you mentioned that has been so heavily subscribed to and in fact if you've applied for the HGV or the van scrappage scheme that was actually suspended last year because they said the demand was so unprecedented and it's left many people many working families in a difficult situation with a per per perfect perfectly good sort of car whether it's diesel or petrol and, and unable to use it so it's really difficult and I think it's divided a lot of people in London so I'm um, the reason I'm here is because this was the launch at the Olympic Stadium of the ULES expansion I was speaking to Mayor for London Sadiq Khan earlier and I put some of the points to him and this is what he had to say. Thousands of motorists who, who have applied for the scrappage scheme have either had their application rejected or suspended. Some of these are drivers who are sort of worthy of your scrappage scheme. Are you concerned that many motorists will be missing out? Yeah, if somebody's applied for the scheme and uh, uh, been rejected, uh, they can appeal. One of the things that I've done uh, last week, I, I discovered an example where somebody was wrongfully rejected on more than one occasion. Uh, they, in the end, appealed successfully. I've asked uh, uh, TfL to make sure all those applications that were rejected, I just checked again to make sure no mistake has been made. I'm quite clear, though, that these policies are about addressing the twin challenges of air pollution and the climate emergency. The good news is, is that we know from the ultra-low emission zone from central London that as a consequence of our policies, uh, the quality of air in London has improved by 50%, but also the numbers of compliant vehicles has uh, gone up, non-compliant vehicles gone down, and more Londoners who can are walking, cycling and using public transport, where they can't, they're using a compliant vehicle. A survey showed last week that more than half of Londoners don't know the, that the ultra-low emission zone is being expanded today. I spoke to one man at the weekend who only found out two weeks ago when a letter came through his door. He's got a van that's not compliant. Has the message just not got through to enough Londoners? Well, when I stood for uh, election in 2016, I was talking about this. In 2017, I, was, I made an announcement setting out the dates uh, of this when, when it would uh, happen. In 2019, the ultra-low emission zone began in central uh, London. In 2021, when I ran for mayor again, this was on the ballot paper. As far as uh, I was concerned, there's been a huge amount of publicity in advance of uh, today. In addition to uh, viewers like yours uh, receiving a letter from DVLA, uh, there's been more than 20 million people rigging up our vehicle uh, checker. Uh, we've emailed uh, millions of people uh, 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 who are registered with uh, uh, the ultra emission zone and the sea charge. We've also been doing massive uh, marketing and adverts on radio and on uh, TV. It's really important uh, we do what we can to make sure people are aware of uh, this scheme. I've been doing media on a regular basis in relation to uh, this scheme. We're quite clear. Uh, we've got to address the issue of air pollution now, not kick this can down the road. 
obviously your aim is for people not to be spending the £12.50 a day and you want them to be changing their vehicles but isn't it the reality that there still isn't quite the infrastructure particularly when it comes to electric vehicles in London that many people would struggle if they did have an electric car when it came to charging points? What we do know is that uh, in London uh, we have more than 7,000 charging points. That's more than a third of the country's uh, charging network. We've got more than 300 rapid charging points, many more than any city in Western Europe. We've got to increase the numbers of charging points and rapid charging points. At the moment, we can meet uh, at the demand, uh, but as uh, people move over to electric vehicles, there'll be a need for more electric charging points, more rapid charging points. The good news is, as more and more people are ordering electric vehicles, manufacturers are invested in technology and so the battery capability is improving more but I think we do have to think about the whole infrastructure across the country for example what how do we provide the electricity that people use that should be renewable and so it's really important as a country that uh, we invest in infrastructure. A quarter of London is now in the ULES zone will that be expanding further what next? Well the numbers of Londoners in the ULES zone is almost four million that's double the size of Paris, eight times the size of Manchester, because I think this is an issue where all of Londoners should see the benefits of their clean air, not just those lucky to live in central uh, London as a consequence of our first policy in 2019. The key thing is to address the issue of air pollution. So we're doing a number of things to uh, solve the issue of air pollution. The electrical emission zone is one of them. Uh, all our buses are ULES compliant, but also we've got a record number of electric buses. We now have record numbers of taxis that are uh, electric. We're also doing things to make sure our buildings uh, don't emit uh, toxicity in relation to emissions and so forth. So we've got to make sure we continue to make progress in relation to the twin challenges of air pollution and climate emergency. And finally, we've seen Insulate Britain on the streets of London today by Limehouse Causeway. How concerned are you about these protests and do you think the police are doing enough to stop them? Well, I'm concerned about uh, some of the tactics used by these protesters. They're unlawful. Uh, they're dangerous and they're often not peaceful uh, as well. It's really important uh, for those who feel strongly about this, I feel strongly about this, I feel strongly about the climate emergency uh, and air pollution to take people with us. Uh, and what these protesters are doing is not only risking their own safety, risking the safety of others, but driving people away from an important issue. The police have made a, a number of arrests uh, today. They'll continue to do so when people break the law. Alice Porter there talking to London Mayor Sadiq Khan about the London Emission Zone, which is the area inside but not including the north and south circular roads. You're watching On the Money with me, Liam Halligan. Stay right with us because after the break, I'll be joined be with, by the man behind one of the UK's largest motor retailers for our Daily Money Talk series. Before that, here's the GB News with Amelia Harper. I'm Amelia Harper. Here are your latest headlines. The average UK petrol price has reached an all-time high at 142.94 pence a litre. On Sunday, prices beat records set in April 2012 by 0.46 pence. Meanwhile, diesel prices reached 146.5 pence a litre. The RAC is calling it a dark day for drivers that will hurt many household budgets. 52 people have been arrested after Insulate Britain brought London's financial district to a standstill today. Protesters disrupted rush hour traffic in the city of London and Canary Wharf. Injunctions have already been filed against some protesters after they caused delays on the M25 and other major roads during five weeks of action. A spokesperson says they will continue until the government gives a meaningful statement that they can trust. Scotland's First Minister says the COP26 Global Climate Conference in Glasgow could be the last opportunity to avert a climate catastrophe. Nicola Sturgeon says Scotland is in a unique position to bridge the gaps in conversation between world leaders. Elsewhere at Downing Street, the Prime Minister has been speaking to children about the climate conference. Boris Johnson says meeting the goals of COP26 would be very, very difficult, but he says, I think it can be done. The Health Secretary, Sajid Javid, says the government is heading towards legislating mandatory COVID vaccines for all NHS staff. A member of the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation is also urging NHS workers to get double jabbed as a matter of professional pride. 
The ultra-low emission zone is expanding in London from today, now covering a quarter of the capital. Drivers of older petrol or diesel cars will have to pay £12.50 a day to drive into the zone. The Mayor for London, Sadiq Khan, says the scheme will clean up London's toxic air pollution. I'll have more on all of today's main stories at the top of the hour. Welcome back. You're watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. We've been speaking about funding for the NHS backlog. backlog. Is money really the answer? And all I can say, there's been a tsunami, a tsunami of emails. Hundreds of you getting in touch to give us your view. We will return to this discussion either on Thursday or Friday after the budget, once we've seen the colour of Rishi Sunak's money, if you like. Daryl says we should run the NHS as efficiently as possible with whatever budget we're given. Once that's done, then we can increase funding. Helen says, so many doctors get their training in the UK, then go abroad to Australia and the US to work for higher paid jobs. It's true. After obtaining training here, they should have to sign contracts to work here in the UK for at least 10 years. William says, too many back office staff and overpaid administrators to manage too few doctors and nurses. The NHS needs breaking up into more manageable units with lower overhead costs. Andrew says, the NHS clearly has a huge problem with management of its organisation. This is evident by the fact that no credible and stress test disaster plan was in existence when the pandemic started. Marianne says, if you have the money and you can pay privately and get an operation done quite quickly. So it's about a shortage of medical staff in the NHS. Why is there a difference in how quickly it can be done if you have the money? Keep your emails coming in. A hugely important debate. We won't shy away from it here on The Money. Now, time for my daily in-depth interview series, Money Talks. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Robert Forrester. He's CEO of Virtue Motors. That's the North East's largest motor retailing company. Robert started his career as a chartered accountant but soon found himself in the property investment business as a director at Brookhouse in Manchester. He then changed the entire direction of his career after a near-death experience with meningitis. And as Robert recovered, he moved to the northeast of England, where he became finance director at the legendary car dealership Reg Vardy, before helping to set up Virtue Motors in 2006. 
The company has continued to grow and is now one of the UK's largest automotive retailers. It operates across 110 sites, employs 6,000 people, turning over the thick end of £4 billion a year. And here to speak about how he built his business is Robert Forrester. Robert, great to see you. Car retailing, there's still money in it, right? There is still money in it. Very low margins, but we make a living. So you're turning over, as I said, almost £4 billion a year. And I think the last numbers I saw on your half-year profits were about £51 million. So say you're making £100 million a year of profit on £4 billion. That is quite a low margin. Yeah, and that overstates it, because record profits at the moment due to very specific supply constraints. We tend to keep about a pound in every hundred. So that, that suggests to me, as somebody looking on at your business... You're clearly operating at quite a scale, but with the margins you're talking about, it's clearly a very competitive business and the customer has power to shop around. I think in economics terms, it's the nearest thing you'll find a perfect competition. There is a dealer in every town and the competition is very, very strong and that's great for consumers. I think of car retailers a bit like I think of builders, not that you've got dirt under your fingernails or I'm going to ask you to come around and do the plumbing or fix my roof, but... Your business, like the building trade, I think you're a bellwether for the economy. You are at the sharp end. Customers only buy cars if they're feeling reasonably chipper about the future or they delay. So in the round, where do you think car sales are in the UK at the moment as we come out of the pandemic? Yeah, we sell cars and we sell a lot of vans. So we've got 6% of the van market in the UK. And at the moment, demand is actually very good. Uh, we came out of the pandemic, people had a lot of cash because they hadn't spent anything. Their alternatives to spend, like holidays, was, was curtailed. So the car industry and the van market has seen a massive increase. The in online retailing has massively impacted van demand. So the demand side of the economy is very strong at the moment. So do you sell mainly from physical showrooms or do you sell mainly online? And how, how's, how's the share uh, of your business uh, changed over the last five years? Uh, it's a combination. You can't sell from a forecourt without selling on the internet. And I would say it's changed the last five years I, insofar as I don't think anybody now visits a dealership without having been online first. You have the ability to buy a car completely online but if I said that we sell, for an inquiry online, 0.8 of 1% actually buy purely online. So we have a 30% conversion ratio on normal sales, but the online itself model is very, very low conversion because you're talking a lot of money, you're talking it's complex, uh, and therefore people want a video, and it, or to even go and do a test drive, and over 80% of people want to do a test drive. So customers are getting more clued up to oh, use the oh, vernacular, definitely. which means more competition which means it's harder for you guys. I wouldn't say it's harder. I think if you do the job right, actually, if, if somebody inquires and we get back to them quickly and we build up a good relationship with them, we send them a video quickly, we can conduct the sale very, very quickly and remotely. Uh, it's impossible to buy a car from us without using a mobile phone, actually. So you operate mainly in the northeast of England. It's part of the country that I've made a point of visiting a lot over recent years, and indeed we, we've met mm. in, the, in the past on, on one of my regular... Trips And the reason I visit it isn't only because I, I like the people and the, and the industrial heritage, but, it, but also, with all respect, it's the UK's or one of the UK's poorest regions, uh, and yet it's one of the UK's leading export-generating yeah. regions. So it is clearly a prime place for levelling up and yeah. potential, and indeed the government's focus very much on the North East, yeah. with moving the Treasury to Darling, the Tees Valley Development Corporation, and so on. So you're telling me, Robert, that even, with all respect, even in the northeast of England, car sales, van sales are quite strong. That points to quite a lot of economic optimism out there. Yeah, we run dealerships from Glasgow to Exeter, Kent, uh, but we are the largest in, in the northeast. And the northeast, actually, economically now is very buoyant, uh, very low levels of, uh, of unemployment compared to historic levels. And I don't see much difference in regional demand, actually, across the entire United Kingdom. I've never seen much regional variation. We tend to operate as a single economy, I think. Uh, but certainly the North East is buoyant, particularly Teesside. There's a lot going on in Teesside, probably more than Tyne and Weir at the moment. Uh, and I think we can 
we are headquartered in the northeast. You know, we employ 500 people at the centre, mm. and actually there are very few headquartered companies in the northeast, and that is one of the problems. Actually, historically, we've been a branch plant economy. We haven't had headquarters and the the higher uh, skilled jobs, and and I think we've done some small part in in the 15 years we've been going in actually reversing that. Mm. Obviously, for many households, a car is the second biggest yeah. purchase they'll ever make after a house, albeit it's a purchase that, you know, you buy more than one car in your life, most people. So let me ask you this. What share of the cars you're selling are bought with finance, uh, with debt, yeah. and what share are you, buy, are you selling for cash? Because that's quite an interesting metric in terms of how um, well how flush people feel to yeah, use yeah. to use a street word um on new cars i would say 85 90% are, are actually funded on finance and that's because the manufacturers give you preferential interest rates and use it as a means to make cars affordable on used cars it's probably around 40% provided by the dealer but i think there's another percentage provided by banks and other finance providers i think most people actually will will purchase a car on finance finance is cheap They've got other things to spend the money on. We did see post lockdown an, an increase in cash, actually. Right. Bounce back loans coming into the economy. Yeah. And also, people have just saved a lot of cash because they couldn't spend it. But that's normalised now. We're back to normal. Let me talk to you about electric cars. One of the, when, I, when we arranged this interview, it was the thing that was sort of front and mm. centre in my mind. I thought, oh, Robert will have an mm. interesting view on that. There are other car dealers we often have on the show who aren't convinced by electric cars or don't think their punters, if you like, are convinced by electric cars. What's your thought? 2030 sales of new petrol and diesel cars, we're told, will be banned. Do you actually think that ban will happen? I guess you're certainly planning for you know, a big increase in sales yeah. of electric cars. And we've seen a big increase, predominantly actually in hybrids rather than pure electric. Yeah. Um, the challenge with it is not that the cars can't be made. The range on electric vehicles now is now reasonable. Yeah. You can have a reasonable electric car. They're pretty fun to drive. Uh, the challenge comes around infrastructure of charging. Uh, and actually, have we got the electricity to actually do it? I mean, everybody said electric vehicle inquiries rose significantly when there was a fuel crisis a few weeks ago. Yes, but I'm not looking forward to a three-day power cut either when you've got an electric vehicle. I think that'll be very interesting to watch. <laughs> So, <laughs> which is on the horizon, we, as we, we all know. We were brushing our teeth in candlelight when we were kids, weren't they? What about <laughs> if you can't even... Can't well, even... Uh, my advice would be have one of each. Yeah, yeah. Have an electric car and have a, have a petrol or diesel car, if you can. So, I think the challenge is around infrastructure. You know, can you charge your car up? The technology will move at pace. I actually think we will get to 2030. It will be in line, because I think the government are absolutely committed to it. And the manufacturers are committed to it. They're definitely ploughing the billions into R&D. We're getting some fantastic electric vehicles. So if they can get the charging structure right, we'll be fine. I hear people in the car trade say to me, oh, the trouble is, though, that the batteries wear out, so these cars have no resale value. You know, if you buy a good new car or a good nearly new petrol or diesel car, you're thinking, oh, that's going to cost me 30 grand, but I could sell it for 15 grand in four or five years' time, recycle the money, put it into a new car. Is there a danger that with the battery technology, you won't have that high resale value for used cars? I, I don't think there is, actually. I think there will be a lot better than people are imagining. I think they will have a resale value. And actually, you could have a re-engineering where you just replace the battery. And actually, as a business, we do replace batteries now when they go wrong, because right. you have manufacturing faults. Um, I actually think the bigger danger in the short-term electric vehicles in the used market is the pace of technological change. Right. So three years ago, an electric vehicle is not the same as a new one now. The range because it's is going extended. so fast. Yeah, massively fast. I mean, I am... I'm about to get an electric vehicle uh, as, the, as a second car, and the range of that vehicle is massively enhanced compared to the last time I had an electric vehicle, which barely got me to work, and I live close to the office. What about electric vans? A lot of our viewers will be people who drive vans or they're in you know, households yep. that rely on, on using vans. Are electric vans the future too? Because obviously a van's heavier. If you talk to somebody like Anthony Bamford, who runs JCB, yep. he says electric with diggers, it's... They haven't got the power to drive a huge, heavy vehicle. Electric vans are coming. Yeah. Um, I actually think, as well, there'll be, there'll be shifts. I mean, the Chinese, we've now got the MG franchise in the UK. Yeah. That's the economic and electric from a car standpoint. 
there are going to be very good vans, but they're not going to be for long distance. They'll be for short drop-offs. And when do you think they'll come? And sorry, I should know this, Robert. Does the 2030 ban apply to vans as well, or is it just it's going cars? To be, it's going to be very, very fast. That I, mean, I think the van market could very well move quicker than the car market. Wow. Uh, I, I think we are preparing ourselves for quite a deluge of product on vans. Another thing, we often cover on, on the show you know, supply chain issues, mm. labour shortages and so on. Um, we often get Nicky Jolly on from mm. your part of the country, somebody I think yeah. you know, a leading recruiter of skilled yeah. workers up there in the northeast. Um, can you find the staff that you want to be working for your company? Not only the, 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 the top managers and the middle managers, but the entry-level staff who come with good attitude, uh, who you feel you can promote through the business? The biggest issue our business has faced since coming out of lockdown three is the tightening of the labour market. Yeah. Uh, we have been running with 500 vacancies since March. So 500 vacancies, that's about a 10%. tenth, ten, tenth no, of your not workforce? Far off 10%. And Are you offering more money? Is yeah, it a money thing right. or is we, it a just no, skills thing? It's a, there is a shortage of labour, full stop. And yeah. you know what happens in markets when there's a yeah, shortage, yeah, the, the price, price goes, goes up. up. <laughs> we, we announced to our shareholders last week that we were doing two, th two things, 9.5 million increase pay by the 1st of December. Uh, we've already done technicians, our highly skilled technicians who mend and repair the cars. We've just enhanced all their pay. And we're going to take another 120 apprentices on from the 1st of March total £12 million additional cost. But I can't run a business with 10% vacancies. Um, that's, that's astonishing. I'm amazed that it's that high. So am I. We've never run with that level before. But uh, whatever, if, if, your data, if you're, you have data in your title, then the world is your oyster, that's for sure. But pretty well every job role, and this isn't just our business, this is every business in Britain, are struggling to find people. Well, Robert Forrester, CEO of Virtue Motors, we thank you for coming to the studio down from the northeast, and we look forward to seeing you again on The Money. You've been watching On The Money with me, Liam Halligan, every weekday at 1pm. I bring you your daily dose of economic business and consumer news. And stay with me, as up next I'll be joined by my partner in crime, yes, it's Gloria De Piero, for our special budget build-up show. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll see you very soon. I'm Liam Halligan, this is GB News, and that was on the money. Hello. A bright and breezy day for many of us. There'll be some decent sunny spells, but also quite frequent showers pushing in from the west, even some thunderstorms around, because these showers will be very lively, quite an unstable air mass across the UK at the moment, coming from the west behind this weather front, low pressure to the north of the UK. Tightly packed isobars, so a breezy day to come. The breeze pushing the remaining cloud out of the way from East Anglia and the southeast, but soon enough, showers follow in from the west, Frequent downpours in the west especially, but just about anywhere could catch these showers. And where they do occur, there'll be some gusty winds and even some thunderstorms with some small hail in places. Nevertheless, a mild day to come, 17 or 16 in the south, 10 or 11 further north, and that's where the strongest breeze will be. The showers quickly die away, actually, after the sun goes down in many places, but they'll continue around western shores, perhaps the odd one coming close to the south coast. Then later in the night, the cloud thickens in the west and it turns wet across western Scotland and Northern Ireland. That'll keep temperatures up at 8 or 9 Celsius, dipping to 5 or 6 in the east of England, where at least we do have some sunshine to begin things on Tuesday, and we keep that sunshine for much of the morning, but the cloud thickens elsewhere and spells of rain move across Scotland, northern England, into parts of Wales. Some light and patchy drizzle further south, but actually it does dry up a little into the afternoon, although a lot of places stay cloudy. There'll be further outbreaks of rain in the northwest of Scotland, and it's going to be a mild day with this strong southwesterly breeze reaching gale force around northern and northwestern shores. Further spells of rain into the northwest of Scotland on Tuesday night, a lot of cloud elsewhere. And this wet weather sticks around for a time, I think, through Wednesday and into Thursday in the northwest, increasingly focused, though, on Cumbria around the mid to latter part of this week. And it's going to be mild everywhere.
Good afternoon. You're watching De Piero and Halligan, and this week we're dedicating the majority of the show to the budget ahead of Rishi Sunak delivering his third since becoming Chancellor. But first, let's get the news with Amelia Harper. I'm Amelia Harper. This is your news at two o'clock. The average UK petrol price has reached an all-time high at 142.94 pence a litre. On Sunday, prices beat records set in April 2012 by 0.46 pence. Meanwhile, diesel prices reached 146.5 pence a litre. The RAC is calling it a dark day for drivers that will hurt many household budgets. The national living wage is set to rise to £9.50 an hour. Ahead of the Chancellor's budget this week, 